for um, those of you who don't know me, I said I'm Wade Sheldon. Unfortunately, I missed the last um, couple IM meetings um, since we're kind of transitioning over to have Adam Sapp from our site kind of take over a lot of those responsibilities. But um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to to um, present on some software we developed at the GCE site and have been using for many years and is also used by quite a few other LTR sites that has proven particularly useful for automating the kind of environmental data that a lot of us collect. And it's also in recent years been able to generate complete EML described data packages. So this is an opportunity to learn about software that could be useful for some of the new sites ramping up. Okay, just uh, for those of you who haven't heard me speak on the software for, um, for years now, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background. Um, this software is kind of unique in several ways, so it's kind of an interesting case study. It's uh, one of the few or only pieces of software that's really optimized for LTR scale end-to-end -end data management. There are a lot, of, a lot of tools we all use, a lot of things come available, but this is one of the few pieces of software that can go right from a raw data fire, file to a repository and with all of the other steps along the way. So it's interesting, at least as a case study, even if you don't find yourself um, you know, wanting to actually use the software as is. It's also one of the few examples we have of LTR site developed CI that's being released as a community tool. So there's some interesting lessons that we've learned on supporting and funding this kind of work that could be applicable to others. Uh, it also is software that supports several modes of operation. So it's equally at home running on a headless workstation, running data harvesting workflows. And then PIs and students use it, you know, in a more interactive way to actually work with the data we produce. So that's also unusual. And what's particularly the white elephant is that this is software that's been benefited and also suffered from 18 years of production use and development. So it's um, got a much longer lifespan, a lot of software already, and runs on the very latest, um, you know, systems, as well as some um, older equipment. So um, just where I'm going to cover in the webinar today briefly is I want to give a little bit of background on the history and motivation of the development process for people that are, you know, don't know much about this and are interested in where this came from. But then I want to get into walking through some of the key features for data processing, QC, and publishing, which is really the subject that um, I wanted to convey. Uh, I want to, and then I'll show you um, some, where some resources are available for implementing and supporting, you know, um, getting support for the software. And if we have a few minutes left, I'll show you a very quick demo of what it looks like to basically, you know, import some raw data file, do some quick checks and get it ready to publish directly in, EM, in um, EDI. Okay, so the motivation is pretty standard and pretty familiar to a lot of you. Um, we started um, as a new LTR site in 2000 with deer, like deer in the headlights with really no established infrastructure, no software um, in place. Um, so we anticipate a large data collection effort, a lot of um, cruises, sensor deployments, and lab analyses and surveys. Um, but as many LTR sites, we started off with very minimal IM staff, basically just me for less than three-quarter time to provide all IT and IM support for the project. So obviously, I needed to standardize and automate tabular data processing, quality control, and documentation in order to keep my sanity and actually um, manage all of that work. Um, we did a survey of the community during proposal preparation and then after, and we found there really wasn't at that time any ready-to-use software for LTR data management. This was kind of before a lot of the current software sharing culture and infrastructure was in place. There was no GitHub, and there really wasn't a culture of open source sharing at that point. So there were a lot of great reports and papers, good principles, but really no tools for us to pick up. Relational databases were just kind of coming into the scene. Several LTR sites, you know, NTL, Andrews, were really developing um, very nice systems, but they were site-specific and complex. So we um, didn't feel that was going to work for us. So we decided to stay in our own wheelhouse and develop our own custom man data management framework using the MATLAB technical programming language. Um, which was in strong use here at our site. So it had a lot of benefits for us. It was, we already had a lot of experience developing automated workflows and, and graphical user interfaces. It was broadly used in our PI labs. And then another important factor is it has really good platform, cross-platform code and data um, accessibility for Windows, Mac, and Linux, which is important for our mixed computing environment and it scales well. The only con, which wasn't too important to us at the time, but is, you know, is a limiting factor is that it is a commercial license source model. So it's not quite as easy to redeploy for other people as, as um, current open source offerings, but it's still fairly practical to, to go with. Okay, 
Um, one of the big influences that, that made us kind of take, tra- take this path was some recent success we had just before our project started with some software I developed for back in my microbial ecology and marine chemistry days for DOM analysis. And the software called the Fluorescence Data Toolbox, um, it included um, a self-describing data model, combining data, metadata, settings, and QC, as well as an API for automation via workflow and a graphical user interface for PIs to use. And we found that the model and API really simplified our software development the um, automated processing and GUI tools were really powerful research accelerators, and it really opened up some new visual data analysis approaches and led to some very major publications. So this was, um, this was a, a major uh, motivator for us to try something similar for our LTR, so it kind of dictated a lot of the reason we went down this fairly complex pathway. Okay, so the, um, we, for the toolbox development, it really started with a you know, requirements analysis, and back in that era, um, the two most influential works that we used were the Ecological Society of America's Future of Long-Term Ecological Data Report. This was kind of a seminal large report that I recommend anybody dig up if you're new to the field of informatics. It was, it was a major motivator and, and design document behind EML and it really kind of described a lot of really what you need to record about ecological data to use them decades into the future. And it was pretty um, important work for us at the time. And Bill Michener wrote up an excellent chapter that came out in the ecological data book right when we were starting. And he did a really nice synopsis of these metadata standards and really requirements. And so between the two of those, it really gave us a blueprint for what we wanted to manage in our data system. Um, So we started by designing a generalized tabular data model that would hold any any number of numeric and text variables, all the relevant attribute metadata, name units, descriptions, data types, semantic type, precision, and then also stored structured documentation metadata along with the data, include also versioning and processing history and information for basically processing lineage. And then a very important part part that was very um, that was um, very prescient to add at this point was a quality control framework, including rules for every variable and storage for qualifier flags for every value. So that was um, a very critical component of this model. And here's a kind of a, a illustration of the, the overall design of this data model at the data set. There's data set level metadata um, for the whole data set in these files with you know, housekeeping information, lineage information, and then um, this large parsable array of the actual documentation metadata. And then an unbounded set of attributes that include you know, detailed attribute metadata, names, description, units, and such. And then paired um, value and flag arrays that are managed um, along with that metadata. So this this is kind of a nice overview of the the content, if not the exact, you know, implementation structure of of, um, what is modeled by this toolbox. But it's it's all handled essentially as a black box in behind the scenes. You don't really need to know the details, but this is just give you an idea of what, what is stored in this system. Okay, once we had the data model, we started developing software to work with it, um, or developed a MATLAB software library or toolbox in MATLAB parlance. And this includes a series of utility functions to abstract all the low-level operations for creating structures and adding data, extracting, sorting, querying the data. And then we developed a growing suite of analytical functions for all the high-level operations. Think statistics, visualizations, geographic and date time transformations and such. And then um, synthesis tools for, for aggregating, resampling and joining data sets. So these were all kind of layered on top of, of that model. And then over time we developed um, more graphical user interface functions to kind of simplify using the toolbox by non-IM folks. And um, this has proven popular. I said this is actually part of classes and in a lot of our investigators labs now. <clears throat> and then we, um, it's important to note that all of these functions in this toolbox um, use the metadata and data introspection to do a lot of auto parameterization and, auto, and to automate a lot of operations using a semantic processing approach. So you can do a lot of work with very simple commands because the metadata is all there and the software knows how to interpret it. So it really speeds up software development and use of the software. Later on, we added some indexing and search support and a graphical user interface search engine to kind of help you kind of locally manage files. And then also automated data harvesting management tools that um, help use this in kind of a headless kind of implementation. 
Okay, so it started out obviously with a command line interface. It's familiar to people that have been using, you know, a lot of the R tools. Um, so like in this case, one simple high level command called fetch USGS will retrieve data from any USGS station in NWIS and it returns it as a data structure. You can see the kind of the top level fields of that structure, what they look like in MATLAB. And then you call commands like this, the list calls to like see what's in there and extract values and aggregate and do things with simple high level commands. And this is all documented, you know, APIs documented and, um, in several places that, you know, on the resources and there's very detailed command line help for all of the functions in the toolbox. So this is pretty familiar to MATLAB users, but for everybody else, and also just to make things more efficient in the IAM office, we've developed this uh, very comprehensive suite of graphical user interface tools that lets you load the data and view the data, do quality analysis, and then launch all these other tools to process the data. Okay, so the, the main primary tool that first comes up when you first start working with this is called the data set editor. This is really kind of a control panel, um, you know, for giving you a view into a data set and letting you launch all the tools. So it comes up and displays, you know, the attribute list and then lets you, you can click on those and, and tweak attribute metadata and launch a few utilities, you know, for those individual variables. But then it has a very extensive menuing system that lets you um, with a file menu for doing import and export kind of operations an edit menu with lots of commands for viewing, editing the data table and performing data set operations. Uh, hey, metadata menu for managing and viewing the data set metadata and then tools and miscellaneous menus um, for launching other um, controls and widgets to let you manage the, the, all the settings and things for the toolbox and, and um, help menu for getting at the documentation. So this is kind of a, just a, a top level, high level view of your data set that lets you launch everything else. Okay, so the most important thing that most people will grapple with when using any kind of data processing software is how to get data into it. Well, there's a large suite of um, import filters that are pre-configured to allow you to pull data directly into the software. So there's generic parsers for any you know, delimited text file, as well as um, native MATLAB variables um, that are you know, used for that work for a lot of different types of data. But importantly, there are specialized parsers for a lot of the common data files that we work with on a regular basis, including um, instrument maker logger files. For, you know, for Campbell data logger files, we work a lot with Seabird instruments, so we have very nice import filters for, for conductivity, temperature, depth profilers and, and mooring sons, you know, YSI, Hobo, Schlumberse. So we have a large, lot of like vendor specific import filters that are ready to go that will automate pulling in data from those sources. There's also a growing number of um, network data sources that we use. So you can mine data directly from the USGS NWIS, from various NOAA data systems. Um, pull data from ClientDB, HydroDB, if you want to review your data or pull in data from other sites. You can pull in EML described data from the EDI portal or from Data One, where it'll actually parse the EML and figure out how to go get the data and pull them in and transfer them into a toolbox file. And you can also, if you have MATLAB with the database toolbox, you can pull things directly from an SQL database, as well as from a data turbine server, um, which is streaming data middleware that um, is used in some areas of environmental data management. So, and um, you can also just add custom parsers on the fly based on some of these, you know, baseline parsers that include specialized site settings. This is just the dialog you can use to essentially define your own data import filter and have it show up directly in the toolbox menus. In this case, this would be a custom um, Campbell data file where you want to apply, you know, specific metadata and, and pull things in and have, and be able to reuse this on a regular basis. Um, anybody that's worked with me for any amount of time knows I absolutely hate to type metadata. This is my view of um, entering metadata as the old typing pool. So um, metadata entry is time consuming and error prone and tedious. So there's a tremendous amount of um, effort involved in uh, metadata recapture, reuse um, throughout the software and metadata auto generation. So this is really um, heavily oriented towards reusing and automating metadata creation as, and management as well as the data. Um, there are a lot of pathways for actually building up the metadata. Um, whenever there are information and logger files can be pulled in along with the data. If you're loading Campbell files or, or Seabird files and pull everything it can. 
Uh, you can, once you've defined some metadata for one data set, you can just crib that and port it from, you know, into the ones you're working with now. Also, if you do pull in data from a repository, it'll parse everything out of the EML to populate metadata. But importantly, this software comes with a, a set of, um, of template management system that allows you to manage and predefine and reuse metadata content and then apply it to new data when they are imported. And so here's uh, the dialogue of the template editor that shows you the list. These are all the GCE metadata templates that we've defined. And then you click on a template and you have various tools for, for managing and, and copying content between templates. And on the right is just the, the actual little meta, the simple metadata editor that lets you go in and actually put in text into the metadata fields. Another major component of the software is the QC analysis framework, as I mentioned. So this is very, this, this would be a workshop unto itself going through this in detail, but just to give you a quick overview of some of the key features, um, it, it supports a programmatic QC analysis where you predefine rules or criteria and then can fine tune them. And those rules that define conditions in which values should be flagged. Uh, you can have an unlimited number of QC rules for every variable and the rules are automatically evaluated when the data are loaded or when data or rules change. So you don't have to keep regenerating flags. The flags essentially are generated automatically using um, program these um, QC rules. And importantly, the rules can be predefined in the metadata templates so that you can automate quality control on raw data just on import. So that's, that's a very important feature. But as anybody that's done automated QC knows, there's a lot of things you either don't catch or or actually legitimate conditions that you'll end up accidentally flagging if you, if you have too many criteria. So there's also a lot of interactive QC analysis and revision tools in the toolbox. For example, you can display and then assign or clear quality control flags directly on plots using the mouse. Or once you've done quality control on some primary measured variables, then you can combine and propagate those flags to all the dependent columns. For example, if you measure do flagging on temperature and conductivity, then you can propagate those flags to salinity and density and other dependent calc, um, variables. And then you can also manage the flag assignments, you know, removing or editing, um, you know, the flags in, in case um, your standards change or you're trying to map specific qualifiers onto a new controlled vocabulary for a repository, then you, there are tools for um, revising those flags once they've been assigned. Uh, all the QC steps that you do are automatically documented. So everything that you're doing, value changes, you know, clearing flag values are all logged. And then you can also generate nice data anomaly reports that can go right into the metadata to describe all the missing and flagged values for on a per variable basis. So we use that a lot. Um, and very importantly, uh, the toolbox synthesis and analysis tools are aware of this QC model and therefore they can provide a lot of features for working with quality control data. For example, you can filter out or summarize or visualize flag values during analysis, kind of handle them you know, specifically. And also statistics about the missing and qualified values can be tabulated and then used to generate QC rules for the drive data. That's a very important part of our um, you know, data, data um, sampling where we'll take 15 minute data, do the quality control, generate hourly and daily and have those flags um, you know, call out hourly and daily values that have too many missing or flag values so that you can go back and look at the primary data. So that's a fairly unique feature. And so the way these are managed, this is a, a data set from a, from a CTD that's been loaded into the toolbox and you see the flag criteria field at the bottom that shows kind of a collapsed view of these rules and then clicking on edit will open them up into an editor where you can go and fine tune and add and prioritize these rules um, using simple GUI functions. And there's also a library of um, pre-built custom criteria and functions that you can click on buttons and bring up and parameterize to develop to um, set up some more, some more elaborate um, QC models that we've added to the toolbox or you can add your own. Um, so that's all. And then those are all managed along with the attribute metadata. And I said, then if you add new data or make changes, those can be reevaluated. Here's an example of um, some, some quality control flagging that's been done on a mooring data set. Um, we've got some rules called flag no value change that specifically check for stuck sensors. We have a lot of fouling issues with some of our instruments in the water. In this case, it's checking for salinity values that don't change by more than 
0.3 salinity units over a short window and flagging those as fouled. There's some other rules that will flag salinity values when the sensors pops out of the water based on depth readings at different levels. And then you can see how those are, you know, can be visualized on plots to kind of review. Now the, the rules themselves are not displayed, but the flags, you can see the flags are displayed over values and you can handle those and display those in various ways, depending on what you're doing and zooming and zoom in and manage those. Okay, so one important, if you look at this in the context of a data management cycle, starting with the data source, it's important that just the process, that once you've defined an appropriate import filter, you've added a metadata template with some QC rules in it, you can perform a very substantial portion of the data management lifecycle just by importing a file. So you import a raw Campbell file, you're fully documenting it and doing initial QC analysis with one button click or one command in a workflow. So that's a pretty powerful type of automation um, that this toolbox provides. But there's, um, it can do a lot more once you've got the data in there. Uh, there are a lot of, I won't have a chance to go through a lot of these, but there's a lot of post-processing and synthesis tools um, that are provided with a lot, many of them with these, you know, GUI, easy to use GUI interfaces like this one here. So calculated columns can be added, data can be gap filled and drift corrected, which is important for a lot of our automated sensor deployments. Um, and derived data sets can be generated just by filtering values or refactoring data table structure, you know, going from wide to skinny and skinny to wide data models. Um, you can aggregate and bin and, and date time scale data and join and, and merge data together to form composite data sets. And in all cases, all the derived data complete, contain the complete metadata describing the entire data processing history. So when you use this data and generate a daily set, you don't have to start over and build the metadata. It all comes with it. In fact, the data, the metadata get augmented with all the processing information that got you to that daily file. So it, you can just keep working with derived data using the same tool set that you use for the primary data. And that's fairly unique to the software. And as I mentioned, QC rules can be generated um, for automatically flagging synthesized data. In this case, this is the date time interval tool going from like 15 minute data into, in this case, choosing daily data. And it shows you the list of measured variables and gives you options to, you know, group records and calculate statistics for specific variables. And then the little dialogue in the bottom right allows you to set criteria to flag the drive data based on how you know, how many flag or, or missing values there were in the primary data. And so then that generates a whole new data structure with all the metadata as well as the flagging to reflect those, those conditions. Here's an example taking, in this case, pulling some daily data out of ClimbDB, showing the top graph and running through this tool to generate some monthly statistics and setting some criteria. So if, if there are more than 35% missing values in the month in the in the data set in a given month then flag that is invalid or for more than 10 percent flag is questionable and then you can see the bottom left generated monthly file with some you know some flag values when the data were too incomplete okay so when it comes to when the data are worked up and you're ready to archive or publish them there's some native tools that you can you generate a wide variety of output files um, you can gen you know, export your data and metadata in various text and matlab formats as well as general gener generic XML and KML and HTML files for various web scenarios, or you can insert values directly into a relational database. Again, if you have the um, database toolbox. Um, the data can be refactored and published as quasi observations data model. Um, there are tools there for, for automating that process and workflows. And the data can also be displayed on MATLAB generated static web pages and dashboards. Here on the right is a, is a um, dashboard that shows you variables in the file that's interactive with JavaScript where you can display various plots at different different um, intervals of time with automatic coloring based on how many flag or you know val missing values there are to highlight problems with sensors. Um, and importantly you know to this crowd in particular is that you can also then generate EML described data packages and so for going directly into the repository. So this basically once a little anticlimactic, but after you've got it all worked up, you just bring up this nice little compact dialog that just walks you through generating this data package. Since all the metadata is there and, and the toolbox already knows everything about your data structure, all you really have to do is tell it where to put the files, what the data URL is gonna be on your web server, and you know some implementation you know details for what's you know file format 
and what to do with flagged values. Um, there's various options for you can remove them all from the data set or document them various ways. And then the kind of format that you want and then give it a package ID and then it will generate a complete EML file that's pasta ready and the corresponding data file. And I have um, used generated these files from various implementations and run them through the congruency checker at EDI and they pass muster. They're quite complete and would work fine to go directly into the repository. So just by pulling in data, doing some interactive analysis, you can then generate an email data package and you're good to go. Um, but of course, a lot of times you're gonna want, you know, to use these things on an ongoing basis. You're not gonna wanna sit here and do things one off in, in um, data editors. So there's a lot of support for automating this whole process. And you could also generate the EML um, as part of this workflow as well. Um, there's a handy tool that just once you've defined an import filter for a particular type of data, we'll just walk you through just processing all the files in a directory in one shot. And then another tool that you can then load to like load them all in and merge them all together into a time series data set. So this is a really handy way right from the GUI to um, you know, do a lot of batch processing if you've got files that are coming in from, from sensor logs or from technicians submitting data that we use um, regularly for a lot of our post-processing. And also, you can also just set up your own command line workflows for, for data processing. There are demonstration files included with the toolbox that can show you how to make a very comprehensive workflow that you can run in an automated fashion just using the command line. Um, and so, so once you have these things set up, you know, workflow set up, then there's also tools that are available for, for setting up, just setting up, registering all these um, harvests to happen on an automated basis on different intervals, and then just let them run in the background. So we'll have, we have one workstation that probably has 20 workflows running on it to do all manner of things, and then keep logs of what happened and just run them just constantly in the background in a headless workstation. So this has um, been used for many years to automate a lot of our tasks here at GCE. So here's a real-time example we've been, this is our weather station we set up in 2001. And on an hourly basis, the, um, a toolbox workflow will go grab the latest data, append it to the ongoing monthly files, and then generate these XML reports and plots that are then rendered into a web page on our website. So this is like a static, ready to distribute data you know, portal based on just running things through these automated harvesters, including um, quality control of the values. Okay, so a few key concepts I wanted to highlight about this toolbox. One of them is that every operation is performed in the context of this data set. If you remember that model, I mean, everything is done, you know, taking care of the metadata, keeping everything congruent, and keeping everything up to date as it processes, and logging all the operations that you do. So even when you pass data columns to a tool, like to a plotting tool or to another um, data management tool, all the metadata go with it. And then if you, as you pass it through a tool chain, these operations, everything travels with it. So you keep a log of everything that's been done and you don't have to think about that. And also the data, the metadata are used to kind of parameterize everything. So you don't have to spend a lot of time telling tools what to do. You just have to tell them what you want and it'll generate it for you. Um, every workflow step will actually generate a new complete data set. So once you've defined the metadata for your raw data set, you want to resample that data set to a different interval. You want to merge it with something else. You want to, you know, filter it, you know, do, you know, gap fill it. Every workflow step can generate an entire new documented data set that you can then archive independently from the original. So that gives you a lot of opportunities that you never have to stop and go back and write your metadata. It all travels with the data, which is a huge benefit to this approach. And I said, processing history of everything you do gets captured and included in the, in the metadata. And the metadata are always live and updated automatically. If you move columns around, add calculated columns, um, shift things around, the metadata are all live. So you don't have to go back and worry about congruency issues later. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways this can be implemented. Um, as I mentioned early um, in the beginning, that this actually can be used as a lightweight end-to-end -end data processing system, essentially a, a um, canned, simple LTR data management system. In fact, for the first couple of years of our site, that's precisely how we used it. it. It was our information system, but you can use it to, you know, acquire raw data from a logger, you know, fully document it, validate it and flag the data, review it, fine tune it, generate distribution files and plots, publish it to EDI. And then scientists can actually then, you know, use the software to play with it on their own or, you know, to um, 
work with it and integrate it with other data. So it's, it really can be used as a lightweight, small data management system in a box, basically. But it's also, particularly for sites that have an established set of software and processes they're already using, it makes a nice data processing step that can be integrated with um, other tools to validate and flag raw data and then, um, just, and then upload it to your existing IMS for distribution. Um, you know, or put into like a Deems or, you know, put into an observations data model for sharing. So, so that's, um, I think that's a very valid use that I think a lot of sites would potentially find useful for, just use it for part of what they do. And it also, in some cases, actually can be used as a workflow step. So you can tool chain it. We did that as part of the data dirt turbine demonstration where the data turbine manages the data, gets pulled into that system from Campbell Logger um, files and then this software is used to pull that in and do some things with it and then push it to ODM. So it can be used as part of a larger cyber infrastructure using tool chaining as well. Okay, just to, I won't go through this in detail, but just to, I told mention how long this, this has been in use and there's a few key points. And one thing is that there, this was mostly just a site effort and was basically us developing something for us to use. But starting around 2009, 2010, we really began sharing this to other LTR sites. We established code management in an SVN, refactored it to make it a more generic distribution and started, you know, release it under a GPL license. And then we received a little bit of funding from two sources in 2012 and 2013 that really let us kind of bump up um, the quality and support of the software. And when all that money dried up, we just continued to use it at, at the site level, but we have enhanced features adding a lot more EML you know, support. So, so far we've had over 4,000 registered downloads of the software and it's in use by over eight LTR sites. And principally it's, it's um, data harvesters are being used at five LTR sites on a regular basis. Quita and Andrews, as well as GCE, have standardized on this for all sensor data. So this got a lot of mileage on it and a lot of um, use cases. So where to go from here is, is really kind of um, under consideration right now. I think something that would be worth discussing would be a, an LTR EDI GitHub fork where we could make this more of the you know, community version in through that software for anybody that's interested in working on it a little bit more seamlessly. We've given people access to our SVN. It's all already public read, but if somebody wanted to contribute, we would definitely be, you know, game for that as well. Um, there's been a discussion of maybe an LTR working group about keeping some of this, you know, legacy software going, virtual training. So we'll just have to see where, where any interest lies in there, but um, we're definitely open to um, keeping some things going while we continue to use it here. Okay, so here's some resources. Um, you know, the, we have operate a website um, for this software that provides um, information on documentation, tutorials, FAQs, that sort of thing, and distribution downloads, um, well as bug, bug reporting. Um, you can download directly from SVN, so public read. And, um, and peer user support, I said this is unfunded at this point, so user support is on a peer-to-peer -peer model with an email list to ask questions and answer things. So we're usually pretty good. We've got a substantial, about 30 people or so on this email list, so using it at various levels. So we do, um, you know, it's pretty low volume, but, you know, if you do have questions and answer, then ask them and people will be available to answer them. So... At this point, um, we've got a few minutes left. I wanted to at least give you just a very quick little look of what it actually looks like to use this software. So, well, first of all, I guess while it's up here, so this is like, for example, one of these data portal sites that, that is set up. This is like our latest met data where you can see a nice data summary and then plots that are generated that you can click on and see more details. Um, and this is automatically generated. And this is something that's particularly nice are these, these dashboards. This is our live flux tower. And we can look at, just get a snapshot of all the variables. So this, this entire dashboard is generated by one command in a workflow where it used all the metadata in this data structure from our flux tower import to pull out all the details for each variable, generate these plots at different levels of intervals so you can see what's going on and then generate all this information about QC rules and, and ranges of the data and generate an XML file that then the style sheet renders into this dashboard view. And as you scroll down through all the variables, when you've got things where there are problems, things showing up, it'll highlight those and you can see, um, zoom in and see all the problems. And there's another, um, another style sheet, XSL style sheet that gives you a different view where if you click on this one, 
then you can just see a list of variables that you might want to look at and just view just the variables that you want to see. And if there are any problematic variables with a lot of invalid things, they'll pop right up in the list and be automatically plotted. So our technicians use this all the time just to assess our sensors. And it's a very, very useful um, operation to have. Okay, so, um, so MATLAB, it starts up a lot like, you know, kind of the R command window when you first get going. Um, but you can launch a graphical user interface and then just completely ignore the MATLAB command line if you're um, just working, you just want to work mostly with the GUI. So we do this all the time. So you start off with this little, this little splash screen that, that will reopen if you close all the other tools that lets you open a new data set editor window or search for data or, or manage templates. So if we go to the data set editor window, said you start off with this empty data console and then um, you can see the menuing structure gives you the options for, for everything you want to do. So everything's grayed out except for importing data at this point. And you can see the, the toolbox initially comes with a bunch of canned data import filters that show up here. And then all these ones in this lower panel are the specialized site-specific ones that we've added. So, but in this case, one of the generic ones that comes is for Campbell data logger files. So let's just load in a generic Campbell data logger file that came from our MET station. So this will work out of the box with anybody's Campbell table-oriented ASCII file. It basically knows the general format. It'll pull all the file, the variable labels out. It'll pull units if you define them and build descriptions and build just basic metadata just right out of the box. So if you work with Campbell data logger files, you can use this essentially with no pre-configuration to pull things in. And you can see it's pulled in just the variable labels and units that were there in the file. Um, and then, but it's pretty, pretty cryptic pretty cryptic variable names. There's really not much metadata to speak with. In fact, if we view the metadata, there's not a whole lot here, mostly empty fields. It generated an abstract. It generated a few details from the logger file. But other than processing history for what it did loading it in, there's really not much here. So, um, so that's, that's kind of a bare bones way to start, get started using the toolbox. But if we compare that, since this is our station and we've already developed a metadata template, that has details about each variable as well as documentation metadata, we can do the same thing. We can import data from a Campbell TOA file, but in this case, we'll use our specialized filter that knows this is from our Marsh Landing weather station. And same process, but now it's loaded in the same data file, but now it's applied this template. So now we know more details. We've got much more human readable, variable labels, better descriptions, and importantly, we've got QC rules that have been filled out. So you can see a whole series of QC rules that we define to flag temperature values. So if we take a look at, now we take a look at some metadata, you see that now it's complete. We've got originators, we've got abstracts, we've got methods, everything is here. In fact, actually we have enough metadata to actually generate a complete EML unit document on the fly. So now we've got a complete valid EML document complete with, you know, coverage information, methods, processing history, all the attribute details mapped to the EML unit dictionary and with an STMML generated. So this is really ready to go right out of the box. But of course, um, we want to be able to do a little bit of inspection on this and see what's going on. So what we often do, we'll take a look at the actual data table. Here's the data table that we can view. It kind of comes up essentially in like a database um, table editor where you can select rows and clear things out and edit values. Um, the first thing we often do is filter the view to just show anything with flagged values. So now you can see there's some values that are flagged. If you could hover over them, you can see the flags that are assigned. In this case, these are some, some weird values of air temperature and some humidity values that exceeded our QC rules. Um, you can't see exactly what rule was applied here, but you can at least see the values that are flagged. Um, so if we go back and see for that humidity with all those flag values, we can take a look at those QC rules and see that a lot of them are being tripped up because there's a rule that said any values over 100 should be flagged as questionable. But we live in, we work in an salt marsh with a lot of humidity, so that might be a little, that might be a little bit stringent. So if we tweak that rule and say, well, sometimes we do legitimately get 105% precipitation, let's revise that rule. And now we'll see what the humidity looks like if we plot it and see if all those, those values are still flagged. 
And so now we see those flag values are gone. So before, if I did it before, um, actually I should do that. So if we tweak the rule back to flag anything over 100 and redo the plot, we'll see all those flagged values where it, it was very humid and it got just over 100%. So, so that just gives you an idea of um, the interactive nature of, that you can do with QC and data visualization. Um, you also see this weird spot down here where it looks like there was this weird jump in the data and we can see it looks like there was a data gap. Well, if you look, go back and look at the values, you'll see that the sensor cut out, that the station cut out for, for a while. And so this is not a monotonic data series. So this happens a lot with sensor data and before we do any gap filling or a lot of analysis, it's important to have a monotonic data series. So we, there are a lot of date time um, tools that are available for that. One of them is expanding date gaps. This will basically pad out date gaps automatically. In this case, it found 472 null records um, that were keeping us from being a you know complete data set. So now if we plot it, we'll see that now there are missing values that are padded this out and then you can do gap filling and other things you know, to take it further than that. So I don't have a lot of time to, to go a whole lot more into data processing, but you can see from the edit menu, there are a lot of tools here for you know, interpolation, for replacing, you know, managing data values, calculating values and those sorts of things. A lot of very rich set of QC tools. So um, we'd be happy to schedule some other time sometime. People want to go through those things, but there's, there's really, um, there's a lot going on here in the software, but I do want to just get to the important part of once you have gone through data review and you have, you're satisfied with the data set, then generating the, you know, export the data set as an EML data package is, is a very simple process to do. So in this case, we'll just um, export it just to this temporary directory, which is called this marsh landing. I'm not going to worry about um, giving it a full server path right now. I'll just pick, here's some of the options. Let's, let's go ahead and remove, um, let's just document the flags for all the data columns. Just a one line header, give it a package ID. And now we have an EML data package. So let's go to normally what I would do is I put this directly on a server, but you can see we've got a, a perfectly conventional CSV file with headers and it's instantiated the flag columns for all the data columns and filled in any flag codes. And then we have a completely usable EML file that contains all the details from the metadata, including, you know, coverage and methods and instruments, and then detail all the processing history from the toolbox, full attribute descriptors mapped to the EML unit dictionary, and this is ready to go right in pasta. So it's a pretty simple process once you've got your information staged to um, carry it all the rest of the way. But I see I'm up to about 45 minutes, so I think at this point I will stop sharing the screen and we can um, see if we've got any specific questions that come up. So let's see, how do I unshare the screen, Suzanne, or can you? Uh, I think oh, you I see, I got it at the top. Yeah, I got it. It was hiding behind my camera, so. Oh, okay. Let's see. Thank you very much, Wade, for the interesting, oh, you're still there we go. looking here. For the great presentation, and it's really impressive, and I hope we can establish a collaboration between EDI and you. So far, we list the toolbox on our resources, on our website, under resources, you know, for creating email. Right. But it would be nice if we could take that further and make right. it. Right, yeah, I talked about with Kristen about that. She put some initial entries in. We're talking about flushing that out. And I do think ideally it would be nice to have, have an or instance of particularly this public toolbox available actually in the EDI software repository. I think that would be a good goal and we can discuss. Oh, yeah. How Definitely. to make that? How to make that um, happen? So, yeah. so that people have a an environment that they know that they're you know a little bit clearer cut how they can contribute to it and how they can do pull requests and things. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a question. So, okay. what is the learning curve? 
Is it a steep learning curve? Or? Well, we have, we've, um, during with some of the funding we had a few years ago, we did put together like video walkthroughs and some starting. So it, it varies a little bit. Um, we've had some people that can fire it up and you can, since you can start and end the whole thing, you know, with a GUI, you really don't need any MATLAB knowledge to use a lot of the basic features in the toolbox for someone that just wants to fire it up and load data from Campbell Logger or pull stuff from USGS. Um, you know, you could just with a, you can experiment on your own, but with just a few minutes hand holding, you can, you know, be up, be up to speed because most of the, you know, a lot of the GUIs particularly have good documentation. There's embedded documentation in the software. So Kristen might be in a better place to uh, person to ask for that because she has helped people use it at SEV, but it, it varies. I think it would definitely help from having some, you know, a little training workshop or hands on to get started with it. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, like anything else, if you really wanted to thoroughly customize it for your site, that could require a little bit more um, experience and hand-holding. But to do a lot of the most basic things, I think you can get up very, very quickly in a day to do, um, to, you know, launch it and load in some data and start playing with it and experimenting pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's impressive. Especially if you have data that confirms any of the formats right. you are already there for which right. you templates. Yeah. Right. And there is a little wizard to help like pull in ASCII files, you know, that'll help display the files and help you, you know, identify unsupported missing value codes or things. And then, and, and once you walk it through importing an ASCII file, it'll even give you an option for adding a custom import filter. It'll write it for you and add it to the toolbox so you can use it again. So there's ways that it can help basically build itself up. And, you know, mm -hmm. for, for repeated use just by, let, by using the toolbox. Yeah, yeah. And a few other things, like it's got a very comprehensive unit conversion dictionary that you can extend yourself. You can do a lot of, you know, unit conversions and things on the fly. So there's a lot of, like, user extendable parts of it that you just get populated as you use the software that work, you know, for your site. Mm -hmm. Are there any other question from, questions from the audience? <clears throat> Yes, fun in the chat window from Rachel. Okay. Or can you see it? Yes, I can. Yeah. How did you implement the metadata creation to document the data cleaning process? Um, let's see. So implement the metadata creation to document the data cleaning process. Okay. So um, several things. Um, one of the things I said, everything that you do as you're cleaning up data, um, that basically is a processing lineage that gets tracked for every step that you take. So for example, if you go in and you filter out some records, you run a transform to you know, do some gap filling or revised values, or you go in and do point edits in the data editor, um, all of those things are actually documented as like this value in this row was changed, you know, from this to this and, and these value, these rows were deleted. So there's essentially a log that gets built automatically and that goes into the metadata, into the EML as essentially an entity method. You know, all that processing history gets logged by date and, and at a fairly fine grain level. Um, it's more challenging. We've got really bulk things. So one thing that, that um, you know, I've kicked myself for not having that I think would be beneficial to try to figure out adding is the ability to essentially take the interactive processes you do in data cleaning and actually generate the workflow that you could then rerun to do that again. That was something that we didn't, you know, really occur to us early in development that is becoming more um, of an expectation or a want in um, data processing software that would be nice to have. So, so right now that process is done by essentially narrative documentation of all of your changes, but it doesn't generate the code to redo it. So there is a, that level of kind of interactivity that would be better to, you know, find a remote, robust solution. So um, the next question, is there any plan to port this to an open source language like R or Python? Well, that's kind of like, um, you know, that's, that's several people have expressed interest in doing similar things in Python. Python is the natural port for this. Um, one of the reasons being that a huge amount of, the actual underpinnings of this toolbox and the entire quality framework are built using logical indexing, which is a very advanced feature that is core to the way MATLAB works and is really well supported by scientific Python. And some people working for other programs have really got excited about trying to port it um, into Python. Certain things that it does, I mean, just using it as a template for the way to do something in R, I'm not that familiar with, but I know that Emily Stanley at NTL 
had a graduate student that did certain things like that. Um, that, you know, that she did find some ways to do similar things or, you know, from within R. Um, so I'm not the best person to ask about the particulars of that, but there are some people that have had interest in doing it, but that's when you're talking about years worth of work porting into another language and there's really been no, you know, driver or support for that, partly because one of the, one of the features I mentioned, this has been in use for 18 years. One of the reasons that's practical is because of MATLAB's long-term stability. Um, and so I think that's been one benefit of using MATLAB is that unlike Python, unlike Java, uh, R is a little newer than this, but um, this is something that you can run on any version of MATLAB since like the, you know, late 19, you know, 1990s and right up to the latest version. And that's unusual. So that's one thing that I think has been a benefit of doing it in MATLAB. But um, interoperating with those other platforms is definitely possible. And re But rewriting it, I think it'd be best to use this essentially as a um, kind of a reference implementation for how to proceed. But in terms of a direct code port, that would be a, a tremendous amount of work. I have another question. So okay. do you think this is um, mostly suitable for sensor data or how about um, less, you know, regular tabular data? Um, well, it's idealized for sensor data, but it works very well for spreadsheet data. In fact, the toolbox comes with a spreadsheet template that you can give to people that can, they can fill out general documentation metadata and paste their data table you know, in there and fill out some of the attribute metadata and it'll pull that in and pull all the information out. And we use that a lot for just post-processing investigator data from lab studies on spreadsheets. So it works perfectly well for that. Um, you know, it's got the usual foibles of trying to deal with, you know, quirky input that can go into Excel that structured data languages don't like, but, but um, that, that, that works pretty well. And um, we use it all that way all the time. But I think it really comes into its own with automating repeated data processing of sensor data because you have this new data always coming in that always needs similar documentation, needs quality checking. And I think it's probably strongest use case is sensor data, but it can work with any tabular data. In fact, just as an example, a lot of the features in the toolbox, you know, for like editing things, you're actually opening um, settings and things like that, the toolbox directly as data structures in the toolbox. So it can be used very generically for a lot of things, but I think mm -hmm. sensor data is probably the strongest use case. And do you uh, do any taxonomic um, name checking or do you connect to a thesaurus? Um, there's, there's some capability. For example, we've, we've got some automated MATLAB workflows for doing like ITIS, you know, taxonomic retrievals and things. And so it does a few things like if you've got a column of species names, it can actually look those up in ITIS and add TSNs, you know, a column mm -hmm. of TSNs, and it can, and there's some other potential for doing other related things, pulling the rest of the taxonomic hierarchy in as keywords and things. So we have a lot of pre-built things. We use it that way for some of our data sets, but that could be better developed, but there's a lot of underlying support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Hi, hi, Wade. Thanks for this presentation. It was uh, fantastic. I haven't been, um, I haven't had a chance to dive into the GCE uh, toolbox yet, um, but I'm looking, I'm, I'm very excited about the potential of this. And um, one question I have for you is who are the current maintainers of the toolbox and um, potentially future maintainers? Do you, do you have a plan going forward for some, a primary person or, or group to, you know, can ensure that this, uh, this work continues? Uh, well, it's been primarily me, but um, Adam Sapp has been, you know, contributing to it and working here, you know, at GCE with it for the last six years. Adam Kennedy at Andrews is a very heavy user. They said they've standardized on it for all the sensor data processing in Andrews. He's contributed a lot of ideas and feedback. But in terms of the actual code development work, it's been pretty much a GCE enterprise. Um, so I think, I mean, the code's been out there in the open source. A lot of people have pulled it in, people have customized it, they've tweaked things, nobody's contributed anything back. I think that's a common pattern with a lot of these 
packages. So in terms of maintenance, really nobody has really stepped forward with any kind of commitments. It, it maintain it remains a core part of our, our C infrastructure at GCE. So back when we made it open source, we decided we added the ability to essentially extend it for site capability. So we can we're working on the core, we're using the core software. And so as we work with the core public distribution of the software, we can, you know, any bug fixes or things that occur to us, can, we contribute back to the core public instance. And then we have our own customizations here that are maintained separately. So, so we're kind of maintaining it through use at GCE, but other than us and, and Andrews, and then a lot of feedback from Coweta, um, it's been pretty much a, a GCE show. So that is an open question. Um, so we'll kind of have to see the, I think momentum has shifted away um, from, you know, using languages like MATLAB towards Python and R. So I think I can see, you know, momentum shifting and people using this more as an inspiration or example. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's kind of hard to envision, you know, but it will remain, um, you know, a core part of GC infrastructure moving forward. We just got renewed. So I mean, there's a good commitment to keep using it here. So that will, you know, keep things in the pipeline. But in terms of like the support resources and things, we're operating like the a track wiki and SVN. I think it wouldn't be bad to kind of push that more into kind of a GitHub environment and kind of broaden the base a little bit and provide a different mechanism for documentation and feedback and ticketing. So I think that would be a worthwhile thing to proceed. And then, then that might change the momentum a little bit. We'll have to see, but we don't have any experience yet with that. It's been a, it's not a closed infrastructure, but it's been a controlled infrastructure here. It'd be nice to see what happened with a community version. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I had a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so as far as like an EML template, um, if you had a data set you wanted to add um, and you wanted to like then load that onto EDI, is it the responsibility of um, you, the user, to add in the fields that would match what would go into EDI or is there like templates available in the toolbox that match the current like e version of EML that have all the fields that you would need, I guess. Okay. Um, well, so the, the toolbox, we didn't have a chance to go through it, but the toolbox is a very simple and easy to understand metadata model based on, you know, these categories and fields and values from the ESA FLED. So those have been all mapped for you to EML. So you fill in very obvious things like data set title, you know, and data set investigator and you know with the subfields for email and name and all that and um and then methods and things it's very simple text field kind of metadata and once that's in there those are automatically mapped to eml and you don't have to worry about that part of it um, but another thing i didn't mention is if you had a situation where you had some you say you wanted to just use the toolbox to add a table to an existing eml document you also can generate just the data table metadata and STMML, you know, metadata, and then just put that directly into your other EML document. So it kind of depends. It, it can be used, you know, using the fairly simple metadata model, and there's examples that come with the toolbox with pre-populated metadata, and you just, just put in, you know, text in boxes, and it'll map it to EML. So um, for the, you know, it's mostly, it's going from a simple metadata model and automatically putting in email for you, so you don't really have to worry about all of that. But you may, if, if you had a situation where there were parts of EML that it wasn't set up to populate that you wanted to do as part of a site, then there are ways that that could be done outside of the toolbox using style sheets or other things to kind of augment your EML that we could help work, work with you on a case by case basis. Are there any other questions? Okay, I should mention we're going to be having a workshop. This is used a lot for ClientDB, um, you know, data management right now and contributing and running harvesting services. So I think a good time, well, some of us will be together. We might have some discussions at our ClientDB um, transition workshop in a couple of months. So if you have questions and let us know, we can maybe talk a little bit more about some of the potential, you know, EDI hosting, you know, and transition kind of issues as part of that discussion. That would be a good yeah. time to think about that. I'm sure there will be time for that, and we can actually put that in the agenda of the, right. of the workshop. Yeah, right. yeah. For some of the tools for either generating ClimbDB contributions or, or, you know, at least helping transition workflows to contribute to a ClimbDB. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah.